Who are the people who risked it all just to squeeze out an extra buck? Let's get started with number four, the Kardashians. Kim Kardashian and Scott Disick have been named in a lawsuit over promoting luxury prizes for a fake lottery scam. According to the lawsuit, Kim and Scott helped curate it, an Australian law firm, to promote a giveaway that was a front to sell personal information to advertisers. Winners of the giveaway were entitled to $100,000, two first-class tickets to Los Angeles, and a three-night stay in Beverly Hills. However, when the winners of the giveaway were announced, they quickly changed their Instagram status from public to private, as if they weren't real people at all. The lawsuits allege that this behavior was suspicious, and as a result, the entire lottery was as phony as Chris's reaction to Kim's tape being released. Curated claims that the lottery was legitimate and that they have documentation to prove it. According to them, the lottery winners are only chosen by a third-party facilitator who conducts a random draw of all available participants. The company also argued that it chose a fully qualified independent scrutineer to oversee the random draw as mandated by Australian law. But that's hardly the most interesting thing about the case. The lawsuit wasn't just against Kim Kardashian and Scott Disick. It looks like it was against all of Hollywood. A part of the lawsuit juxtaposed Kim and Scott with Oprah Winfrey. It argued that just 20 years ago, celebrities like Oprah Winfrey were giving out cash and cars to their fans. However, today's celebrities are somehow doing the opposite of that. Instead of giving out cash and cars, these celebrities seem to only care about increasing their own wealth and status. We know it's really hard to believe that, that claim that Scott Disick and Kim Kardashian of all people are really only concerned about themselves as if they would be willing to exploit the people who admire them for their own personal gain. Both are really well known first for their boundless generosity, not their insatiable thirst for money and fame. W wait a minute, strike that, reverse it, thank you. The suit goes on to name other celebrities that are believed to be doing the same thing. Some of these celebrities include Kris Jenner, Sophia Ritchie, Kourtney Kardashian, Gretchen Rossi, and Christine Quinn. You're probably thinking, wait, that can't be right. Isn't that like half the governing body of International Children's Fund, the charity that gives 99.7% of all donations directly to the cause? No, it isn't. These celebrities all promoted the same lottery as Kim and Scott did and are all guilty of the same crime, argued the lawsuit. However, these other celebrities weren't named as defendants. Strangely, only Kim Kardashian and Scott Disick were named, probably because no one would ever believe Kris Jenner would exploit people this way. It's just not something she's known for. The suit claimed that Kim and Scott were liable for damages up to $40 million because of their involvement in the ad. Number three, far reaching. Brett Favre is a former Hall of Fame quarterback who played in the NFL for 20 years who's made millions and millions of dollars. However, it's highly likely that Favre used his fame and political connections to collect taxpayers' funds for his preferred businesses. Due to his status, Favre had special access to many high-ranking people in government. One such high-ranking person is Philip Bryant, the governor of Mississippi. Favre used this access to allegedly get millions of dollars in state welfare funds for organizations that he was involved with. The entire scandal, it seems, was kicked off by a volleyball facility at the University of Southern Mississippi where his daughter played. Favre had promoted the facility for the Southern Miss Athletic Foundation and was supposed to put up about a million dollars for its completion. A huge chunk of the money that Favre diverted from state welfare coffers went to building that facility. He repeatedly requested funds for the building and leveraged his personal relationship with the governor of the state and the director of the Mississippi Department of Human Services, John Davis, to get it. That was the situation that Favre found himself in when he decided to go all out on getting the state of Mississippi to finance his projects. At the end of the entire operation, Brett Favre was able to siphon around $8 million for himself and for the organizations he favored from the government of Mississippi. However, Brett Favre didn't get the complete freedom to just request whatever Brett Favre wanted. Brett Favre had to make a few proposals and had to scratch a few backs. That's why he made several offers to give the governor, Philip Bryant, and an 
nonprofit director, Nancy New, shares in a pharmaceutical company he was a part of. Part of the $8 million that Favre got was one $1.1 million, which was designated as speaking fees. The Hall of Fame quarterback must really be struggling. Those speeches were never made, and Favre was forced to refund the money. We imagine him grunting something along the lines of, Brett Favre, only throw, no talk, only throw, at confused school children expecting him to give a speech. However, he only refunded about $1 million and is yet to pay the interest he owes on the money. When initially faced with allegations of corruption and embezzlement, Favre denied knowing anything about the payments and their origins. However, the quarterback didn't throw that lie particularly well as he was soon caught out by damning leaked text messages between him and the governor of Mississippi. But how did the governor get involved in this entire mess? Favre's entire scheme was coordinated and planned with another individual named Jake Van Landingham, who was a Florida neuroscientist and the CEO of Provacus, a pharmaceutical company. Jake had gotten Favre on board to promote his company and new wonder drug that was yet to get FDA approval. According to Jake, the proceeds from the drug's success could make both him and Favre extremely wealthy. However, there was one tiny problem. Jake needed funding to go ahead with research and testing for the drug, and the entire project would go bust without these funds. The first plan to get these funds was to speak to the governor of Mississippi. As text message records show, Jake texted Favre and asked him how to get state funds from the governor and how to potentially compensate him for offering these funds. In those texts, Jake said that the worst case scenario would be to give Favre company stocks that could be transferred to the governor. Governor Philip Bryant ultimately agreed to take stocks from Jake in return for help with accessing state funds for Provacus. However, Bryant only agreed to take the stocks two days after leaving office. The clever Mr. Bryant made it harder to trace the stock to deals made while in office. But it wasn't enough to just get the governor on their side. Jake and Favre still needed to knock on a few more doors to get their state-funded gravy train running. The next door that Favre and his scamming wingman had to knock on was that of Nancy New. Nancy New was the director of the nonprofit Mississippi Community Education Center. The MCEC got into this mess because the state of Mississippi had given the nonprofit around $65 million in state grants, so it was flush with cash. After getting in touch with the governor, Favre and Jake got in touch with Nancy New. Their first conversation with her went well, and they understood that she might be named New, but she certainly wasn't new to this sort of backdoor business. Favre and Jake gave Nancy the same deal they had given the governor. They would grant her shares in the company if Nancy would facilitate a grant for them through her nonprofit. However, Nancy also told Jake that she wasn't just doing him the favor because of the money. She said she believed that the drug Jake was working on could help kids. She also didn't exactly reject the shares, so there's that. The agreement with Nancy knew was so productive that by the end of the entire scheme, Provacus had received around $2.15 million in welfare money from her nonprofit. Favre was overjoyed with the support Nancy New gave him and his partner, and he sent her a very appreciative text to that effect. Those gratitude texts are now evidence in the corruption case against Favre, Jake, Philip Bryant, and everyone else involved in the scheme. That's why we never say thank you for anything. You never know when it could be used against you. Despite getting $2.15 million from Nancy New, Favre was still hungry for charity funds. He believed he could get more, so he decided to get more by knocking on even more doors. The next door that Favre and Jake knocked on was that of John Davis. Davis was the director of the Mississippi Department of Human Services, which was Nancy News' nonprofit's primary source of funding. Getting John Davis on his side was a bit easier for Favre because he was close friends with the man. He told Jake that Davis was just like Nancy knew and that he could give him roughly the same deal. Favre also mentioned that Jake should get Davis a new F-150 Raptor if all their plans worked out and the drug got all the funding it needed. During this time, Favre was under pressure because he still owed the Southern Miss Athletic Foundation about a million dollars in funding for his charity volleyball facility. Davis assured Favre that he would help with the debt, but that funding never came as Davis came under investigation. Favre turned his attention to Nancy and saw if he could get the money from her. While she did wire him a part of the money, she couldn't finish. It looks like Brett Favre might have to settle his own debts with his own money because life can be cruel. Throughout all of this, Philip Bryant was behind the scenes encouraging Nancy New to get the funding for Favre. And all of these conversations were also captured in even more text messages, which have been converted from SMS messages to evidence. But every gravy train eventually runs out of gravy, and this one wasn't any different. Once John Davis got fired,
retired, Favre and his friends had to eat their taters without that sweet charity gravy. Davis's replacement was a man named Christopher Freeze, and he wasn't buying what Favre and Jake were selling. This irked Jake Van Landingham so much that he asked if the governor could exert pressure on Freeze to unfreeze the state coffers. At the time, funding was also drying up for Provacus, and Jake was also in desperate need of money. The big plan of Favre and Jake was to make a lot of money from the concussion drug that Provacus was trying to make. That's the entire reason why Favre had gotten into the operation. Not for the betterment of mankind, but because he hoped to make millions. Favre was more concerned with the payday he would get from backing the company and the drug than any other thing. In one of his leaked texts, he hoped that he would get up to $20 million in payments from promoting and backing the drug when it eventually got on the market. Brett Favre, surprisingly, isn't new to drug-related scandals. He'd been previously involved with an expensive new compounded pain cream that the FBI later investigated. After investigations, the FBI uncovered a $515 million insurance fraud scheme associated with the cream. The crazy thing about this entire situation is that it was orchestrated by one of the greatest NFL quarterbacks of all time. Despite having such a long and distinguished career, Mr. Brett Favre still found it in him to make one more play. While the case is ongoing, Favre denies any wrongdoing and claims to have been unaware that the money he took from the nonprofit was meant for needy families. Why would Brett Favre think a nonprofit with a misleading name like Mississippi Community Education Center would be helping needy families? It's an easy mistake. Number two, Zordon was broke? Former Red Power Ranger Austin St. John was involved in a scheme to defraud the United States government of CARES Act funds. What exactly did our favorite Power Ranger do? Well, our favorite Ranger until the Green Ranger showed up, RIP Jason David Frank. First, neither Austin St. John or Red Power Ranger are even his real names, which gives you a clue as to how untrustworthy he is. His real name is Jason Geiger. In true Power Ranger style, he didn't off this scam alone. He had some help. Geiger obtained more than $400,000 in fraudulent Paycheck Protection Program loans and then transferred those loans to Michael Hill, the Zordon of the Ranger scheme. Hill called the shots alongside his right-hand man, Andrew Moran, his Alpha 5. Hill's job was to recruit co-conspirators with attitude to the entire scamming operation and use their businesses for the fraudulent loan applications. Moran's job was to help the co-conspirators with paperwork, which often included forging documents and submitting them through an online portal. According to court documents, Jason transferred around 421000 dollars to Hill's bank account after receiving a loan from the government. In total, the gang was able to defraud the government for three and a half million dollars. How did Geiger suddenly think that scamming the government was a good idea? Is it some sort of B-level Rita Repulsa plot that just took a really long time to come to fruition? The answer is no one knows. Jason might not have had the most extravagant Hollywood career, but he was still reprising his role as the Red Ranger on TV. In fact, in 2020, he was on a TV show named Power Rangers Beast Morphers. No one knew that just a few months down the line, he would be morphing right into a courtroom. Jason and his co-conspirators were eventually charged with filing fraudulent applications for loans and could get 20 years in prison. It's like the updated show could write itself. Ah, after 20 years, I'm free. Time to conquer probation. Number one, nothing to see here. Jose Lopez was a public works minister in Argentina who was arrested after nuns caught him trying to stash bags of money in a wall. That's right, you heard that entire sentence correctly, and it gets better. The nuns called the police on him, and when they arrived on the scene, they found Lopez with a 22 caliber rifle. Once the police found the gun, Lopez was arrested. Once Lopez was in cuffs, the police searched his vehicle, and what they found led to an even bigger investigation. The police found wads of cash in several currencies, as well as watches and packages packages inside the bags totaling roughly $7 million. Because of the amount of money found with him, the police had no other choice but to start investigating Lopez for money laundering. His case got so popular that the police had to fit him with a bulletproof vest and helmet to discourage possible attacks by people who wished to target him. When pressed about the source of the money, Lopez said it came from politics and none of it belonged to him, which is a really strange way to answer that question. Lopez's explanation of it came from politics, it's not mine, did not hold up in court, much to his surprise. He was eventually charged with embezzlement and was stuck in jail for five years without a formal sentence. The formal sentence was tricky because his original sentence of six years was still being appealed. While in prison, Lopez turned into a whistleblower and went into witness protection because of his testimonies. However, it might not be over for Lopez yet. A part of the criminal code may let him leave prison early because he's been in prison for almost as long as his original sentence would have allowed had it been affirmed. 
In any case, Lopez has chosen to appeal the judgment of the court releasing him. The court released him on the condition that he pay a $1 million bill, but Lopez's lawyers argued that he ought to be based on his own cognizance. Being a whistleblower and witness protection, however, this may not be the safest option. Maybe he can go hide out with those nuns. Hey, it worked for Whoopi Goldberg. Click to watch one of these next videos. Let us know in the comments below who you think is the worst celebrity around today.